you promised me you weren't coming back. I said I would say good things about you if you left. Oh, okay. Where's your bottle of Coke? Uh, so our next speaker, Jeff, will tell us about Open Power. Thank you very much. I'm assuming you can hear me in the back. All right. I always have to be careful with microphones, so if I do get too loud, please uh, tell me. I spent eight years as a high school basketball referee, so my indoor voice is a little bigger than most people's. I also tend to walk around a little bit more, so I probably should apologize in the beginning to anybody on the streaming. If I disappear off the screen, I'll be back. Don't worry, right? Be careful of step two. That's why there's yellow dots over here. Thank you. I'm Jeff Scheel. How many people heard me last year? Hey, I didn't chase everybody away. That's beautiful. The other great thing is I know more of you this year. And I must say, it's probably hopefully not a public announcement, but you know, Phil, I'm gonna miss you in the crowd. Our relationship, my relationship with Fedora is largely due to that man sitting right there. Although, as I said last year, Josh Boyer, when he worked for IBM, was right. We needed to do lots of Fedora work. Josh, that's the last time I'll give you credit for anything today, I promise. Okay. <laughs> So it's been an exciting year for power, for IBM Power. Let me ask the next question. How many people have actually contributed something to power or touched it in some way? Okay. How many people have touched it with Little Endian? Wow. Cool. Okay. We'll come back to that. Little Endian really comes out of open power and our initiatives with open power. So I was looking for a way to talk to you about open power some more because a lot of people are interested in this. So 
I pose the question, how open is open power? Hopefully, if I spend time on these three topics, by the time we get to the end, you'll go, OK, yeah, I get it. It makes sense. But first of all, what is the Open Power Foundation? Well, it's a group of people. If you remember last year about this time, we were talking about the five original founders of Open Power. IBM, of course, Google, Mellanox, NVIDIA, and Tyann. We'll just go straight to the gold star question. Can anybody tell me what Tyann does? Anybody but Dan Horak here and Peter. Yes, sir. What, what's Tyann make? Motherboards. Motherboards. And thus, they've grown into sort of a white box vendor for people. Exactly. Most people know who Google is, Mellanox, NVIDIA. Tyann's usually the gold star question. So Roddick, please give this gentleman a gold star at the end of the presentation. Those five people said, let's found a group of people, create a foundation that is committed to innovating with power hardware in an open fashion. Now, open and IBM are not always synonymous, especially when we talk power, right? Our definition of open was, you can run Linux on it. <laughs> but hopefully by the time we get done, you'll see that we've gone further. And their first commitment was really to even openness with hardware, not just an operating system or software, OK? This is the present list of people who have joined the foundation. Remember those five? They're still on there. There's about 90 plus people added to it since then. I haven't counted them myself personally. But every time we present this slide, somebody says, oh, and so-and-so just joined. So it's been a very productive year. What's really exciting about this is everybody's bringing something different to this group. If you notice the rings, right? We have begins on the upper or the middle left-hand side with the chip, in, chip and system on a chip people, but works all the way out to academic interests. We have software, system software, I.O. folks. It's really becoming a comprehensive ecosystem. Now, has anybody ever started a foundation or been involved in creating a foundation? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So it isn't perfect yet. We're still growing and evolving. But one of the things that the foundation envisioned was a set of work groups in a variety of areas and oh, by the way, I picked up the system software piece. I helped write the draft charter for the system software work group. Again, if you've ever started a foundation, just getting a charter in place for what you're trying to do can be a lot of work. But it isn't just about system software. There are other groups, including a compliance work group, an IO work group recently founded, probably one of our most recent groups work groups on accelerators, et cetera. As the system software work group, most of what we're dealing with is open source software. So I sort of envision our work group as a self-help sort of organization where we get together and we act as stewards of the initiatives in the open source environments where we want to work. In some cases, we've actually created new open source projects, and I'll talk about that. But in reality, our goal isn't to do something as crazy as fork the kernel community. It's go participate in the kernel community, right? So where feasible, we're just going to be part of the existing open source ecosystem. So plenty of work to do, plenty of cross collaboration work. System software doesn't exist without a dependency on the platform, without knowing what's going on in the processor, et cetera, OK? Where are we at as of January? I know it's February. I do now note it's 2015. Thank you for pointing that out on the first slide that it's still stuck in 2014. My particular work group has 64 participants, representing 20 different companies and four individuals that are unaffiliated. It's a public work group. Anybody could join. 
We'll even let Phil join us if he wants. We've, we've created the charter. We're just beginning in our process to create a public web presence underneath what the Open Power Foundation has. If you're going to share information, you've got to put it somewhere where people can get to it. There are some certainly private communities behind the foundation that have been set up, but we'll be getting more of a public presence. And most importantly, one of the first things that's going to end up out there is a bunch of the documentation all y'all been asking for for years from us. Make sure we get the new ELF ABI published for Little Indian. Make sure we have the set of interfaces we've been using for virtualization published, and we have a wealth of new documentation we also need to create with that. So plenty of work to do in this space. We recognize we have lots of work to do. We have big plans. But we're gathering, we're organizing, we're creating our presence, uh, and it's a whole lot of fun to create something. It's a lot of work, but a lot of fun. Let's talk about the technologies we're using here and we're talking about when we start talking about open power. If you remember last year's talk, we said it fundamentally begins with IBM committing to, to donate the chip and use of the chip of the Power 8 processor. A lot of great technologies in the Power 8 processor, such as eight threads per core and up to 12 cores per socket. The other key piece that's in here that you'll hear me talk a bit about uh, is CAPI and our CAPI Attach, our Coherent Accelerator Processor Interface, noted up underneath the bus interfaces. This is our way of being able to simplify the interface with accelerators such that it no longer looks like a traditional I.O. model where I have to pin stuff in memory, go kick the accelerator, and wait for it to come back and deal with what's been pinned in memory and move things in and out amongst the operating system. This sort of interface allows us to share pointers, chase pointers, and resolve all of that between the two, almost as if the accelerator was running on another core in the system, right? If you think of threaded applications and how they can seamlessly write applications without being worried about cache lines, et cetera, generally speaking, Similar idea. So all of this begins with the Power 8 core. Now the vision of where that hardware and that core goes is sort of a road map. It begins today with accelerators around the core. That's what people are starting to do, and that's what people are starting to build are either unique boxes or unique configurations around the existing core and the hardware that IBM has, and the information that IBM has donated to the world. So some of the first things we'll see it later are new boxes, but still the same Power 8 core that we know, or the same Power 8 processor. The next set of innovations, and people are in the process of doing the design work as we speak, is we've agreed to allow our partners as a part of this to pick up the cores as sort of a Lego Duplo model. Those of you that have kids or that have played with Legos know that you know, letting little kids play with the little Legos is not always a good idea. There are the big blocks, right, that can't go in your mouth. So you always start with the big blocks when you're designing things. And this customizable environment envisions a world where, as an example, the piece of silicon that would normally be a single socket would, instead of containing 12 cores, might contain six cores, and the rest of the silicon is for the people to get creative with. Think system on a chip sort of model. NVIDIA, Mellanox, Emulux, all the rest of our partners are thinking about what they could bring onto the core, put on the chip to address a specific need in the market. I call that the Duplo model. The final model is one where you're either inventing your own Duplos and sharing them, or you're even, even working with smaller bricks. We're just starting to have discussions with third parties at a high level about what that design would look like in the foundation. 
People are already working here, and the vision of where they want to go is falling out of this. And so it's from a hardware perspective, those are always long lead time sorts of discussions. Uh, you know, a hardware life cycle is probably three to four years. Software, it's six months, right? So the things you're going to see, you're not going to see much of this as a consumer yet. But a lot of that work is going on, on the, behind the scenes. What's happening on top of all of that and where the foundation becomes so important is if we do the foundation right and preserve the ISA, the instruction set architecture, every application that fits in our stack, whether it came to the ecosystem through IBM Power or through Open Power, runs across the product line. And so that's where the foundation really helps us, is in preserving that ISA and taking it forward. And then after that, it's all about generating an ecosystem on top of it. Open technology. Now, if you take the stack and work it top to the bottom, hey, we support it open because we had the OS. We had applications. You have things like OpenStack on top of that. But here's where you start understanding how we've opened up the system. So instead of having to run PowerVM as people had to run on the IBM Power Systems, you now have a KVM option. This world sees a world and is a world without PowerVM, and KVM is the virtualization option. We even went a step further. We said the firmware underneath KVM needed to be open sourced as well. I'll tell you more about that. So we opened up the firmware underneath. The only piece of the current Open Power Foundation design point that is not open source is the BMC. And we're in the process of exploring even open source BMC software, such that basically everything on the system could be changed, modified, enhanced, extended. Okay? So that's where we're headed. And back to the applications, we've been able to explore not only existing middleware, but the new things. And this is probably my favorite story, right? So here's where this presentation gets cool, because everybody will recognize this. You see, I have the Docker logo up here, right? <laughs> Can't be a cool presentation without mention of Docker. I need to tell you a story about Docker and why that's so funny. Yes, we've been working on this with power. Why is this important? Well, one of the things we do in our ecosystem is we establish places, Oregon State University in the United States, western side of the United States is one of these places where developers can get cloud images. I approve all requests for cloud images at Oregon State. I got this request for somebody to get a cloud image so he could work on Golang for power. What's the significance of Golang? It's what's underneath Docker. Because we had an ecosystem, because there were people working on it, that's cool. So I reached out to the guy, said, hey, what you up to? How can we help you? He says, well, I interned at Google last year and started working on this. Here's where the open power tie comes in. And since then, we've been actively interacting with these folks, not only on Golang, but also on GCC Go. This is the results of building an ecosystem in an open fashion and making things available. So that's how it all comes together. That's the quintessential success proof point uh, that's occurred in the last few months. The thing most of you folks probably recognize is we probably pulled the crazy of all crazies <laughs> by starting down a path of changing how Linux on power runs. I got to tell you, I was not a proponent of this idea to get started. But I'm 100% behind this today. Little Indian on power is where we're headed. It's absolutely the most significant thing we can do and have done. We got it started in Fedora. The RHEL 7.1 beta has it. SUSE has it in SLES 12. 
and on power even Ubuntu runs Little Endian. Why is Little Endian important? Let me give you a developer's example. If you go out to the OpenSUSE build service and track their build of OpenSUSE, or the open build service, and track their builds of OpenSUSE and compare the big Indian build to the little Indian build, there are fewer test case failures in the little Indian build than the big Indian build. Why is that? Everybody's a little sloppy with their Indianness stuff, but that's work that we don't have to go do. So there's the simple, it just gets simpler from an application and an ecosystem perspective. Now that's not the be all end all. Here's the second reason it's important. If we envision a world that is not homogenous, meaning power does not take over the world, and we acknowledge that this other processor, x86 based processor, is going to exist in the data center, and we know customers stick data on disk, and we know they write applications that exchange information, and we know it's a world where data is being generated more and more all the time, thinking social media type data, being able to access that same, da that same data at the same time as it's being generated or being analyzed or where it was created in the same fashion simplifies the maintenance of the application. In fact, this was Google's biggest insight to us. No, 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 you don't understand our problem. We have years of data that will not be migrated. Okay, I get it. Simplifies, simplifies the interoperability, even over TCP IP. Everybody always says, well, TCP IP, you know, it's, it's, it's well-defined protocol. Sure it is. But you take the same app, try to compile it, run it unchanged, the minute they look what's in the packet, they have to be very careful. So data interoperability becomes very important. And the third sort of clincher for me was the ability to do things like get GPU supported. GPU share system memory, we'd better look at that thing the same way. Oh yeah, we could create a big Indian GPU. Nobody wants to do that, that's expensive. Or even better, create a GPU that runs either big Indian or little Indian, didn't want to go there. So the ability to simplify acceleration in this platform in a common fashion also fell out of that. So little Indian is a technology that's really, from a software perspective, changing the way we're doing stuff on power. Yes, Linux will be the only little Indian operating system on power systems, that's fine. And my big brothers on System Z will be the only IBM platform that's big Indian. So, it's kind of like being the Yaboot maintainer. Not sure you want to be there. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the things that make me the most proud in the last year, what I'll call our signature moments and where we're headed. Remember my mention of the firmware? Open sourcing our firmware for the Open Power Foundation was a huge move for us. KVM was one thing. You could argue, ah, you're just porting an existing project to power systems. It's not like you're taking something that's been closed for years and give it away. Now, this is an all new firmware base, but we took all of that. We put it out on GitHub under the Apache V2 license. Now, some people may say, why that license? It was carefully selected. This is a world where the hardware may be extended, it may be changed, and you don't want to have to be dependent upon Jeff or a core set of people to change that firmware to get to where you want to. Nor do I necessarily want to create a world whereby every change has to be given back to the firmware world. So something like GPL, while you know, we could be very committed to that, was not something that made sense here. There likely will be firmware extensions that people won't want to give back. And so we created this community in July of last year, and it's been growing, maturing, like all good communities. 
We're starting to get some contributions. It's still mostly IBM at this point, but we're going to take it, we're going to foster it, we're going to turn it into a real community. In fact, a lot of these folks, this is their first experience with open source. What do you mean I need to post a patch to a mailing list to be reviewed? I can't take 30 days worth of work and dump it out into the community and call that good enough. <laughs> they're coming along. But as we get a broader community here, they'll evolve and they'll change. And they're working with some of our good folks out of Australia, as our, you know, our Opal team and others. So check it out on GitHub. We're really proud of that. Second thing we did to show you about the innovation, you know, we kept talking Cappy this, Cappy that. We brought our first Cappy based product to market. Now, this isn't an open power system yet, but we took a Redis database application, we pushed some of the activities into an FPGA and hooked out the back of an FPGA a 40 terabyte flash storage device. And we were able to take a config that one would normally build with 12 plus servers on the right hand side that's an admin's nightmare to cable, let alone set up, configure, and manage. And we turned it into a 4U configuration, one server, one storage box, equivalent performance between the two. Simplified footprint, simplified cost. This is the sort of innovation that we IBM said would be interesting, but this is all the technologies that are available now to our open power folks. CAPI, the accelerators, all of the technologies people can go innovate. That way it's not just what good ideas Jeff and his friends have, it's what good ideas the folks at Google will have, or the folks at NVIDIA will have, or the folks at Mellanox, et cetera, et cetera. So that one was exciting to me personally as well. Real value in performance. If you tried to accomplish the same sort of environment of attaching flash to an existing x86 system, you'd have to go through normal storage I.O. So you get some benefit out of using this connection through the FPGA. By the way, that's not a storage bus. There's no device stack. There's no block storage sort of mechanism. It's just talking directly into the box through raw sorts of behaviors, mapping it uh, essentially as a large memory space. Okay. So you can start to do some cool things there. And then we started to do something that I got the ultimate compliment on the other day. We're sitting in the Red Hat office talking about our new server from Tyann, the gentleman who knew what Tyann was. Tyann built their first power system that's available as a developer's box. And somebody gave me the ultimate compliment. Was it you, Dan? I think it was Dan who's been working with it here. He said, you know, there's a few things on there that don't work. <laughs> from a guy who's delivered product from IBM for years, right? We build it, we integrate it, we test it. So beautiful to have a development box that people could work on improving, adding code to, and most of what Dan was talking about is the fact that we've gone from an architecture that was based on IBM things, like a service processor, to now an x86-like architecture based on a BMC. And instead of doing what I'll argue is sometimes our traditional behavior inside IBM, which is you can do it any way you want as long as it's our way, right? Instead of doing that, this team has taken a very proactive approach of making power in this open power environment fit into the existing BMC infrastructure. And instead of waiting three years to get all those pieces put together, we built the platform so that code can come together on the platform and Tyann can begin to see the interest. 
How many people have tried to order one of these boxes besides uh, our folks at Red Hat? Anybody? They disappeared very quickly, which is a good thing. It's a good problem to have. Um, so they're back out collecting more orders. It's an indication that the ecosystem is growing quite well. I think it was about two two thousand U.S. dollars. Three thousand. Twenty-eight hundred. You want one? Okay. Bring me your Amex. I'll take care of that. I don't take Discover. But you see what this ecosystem is about now with develop, development platforms like this, right? Cheap as I could have gotten you a box before out of IBM, all discounts was probably on the order of about $8,000. Yeah, so $2,800. Not quite put it under your desktop, but getting closer. Then, of course, there's the Google board. We talked about that last year. They're still saying very little about what they're doing. That's fine. They're doing good things. What I can tell you is that I know of at least three or four other systems that are in the works in a variety of places, all coming out of the foundation. That's the sort of activity we have. We did start doing, again, something different for IBM. This is my favorite slide in the whole deck because, folks, this is techie pornography. <laughs> For those of you that are still awake back there, what do you notice about this server up here at the top? Right, We, we, we started talking to Timothy Prickett Morgan, I think it is. I always get the last two names confused. If he's watching, I'm sorry about this server, we gave him this picture. What do you notice about this, this server? That's, that's probably another typo on this slide. Oh, that wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me one bit, not typos. What do you notice about the server? When I show you a server, which end of the server do I usually show you? The front. I've shown you the backside of an exposed server. Hiding some things from you. You know. Then I give you a close-up, something exposed as well, right? This is, this, is, this is geek pornography here. But they did go talk about, in the article, and here's, here's the link, and these slides will be available, what's going on. This is a two-socket server. We're working with Wisteron to bring to market five PCIe Gen 3 uh, slots, eight memory slots for a gig, of, a gig of memory capacity. Those were the sorts of things we talked about here. And obviously, if anybody recognizes the green of that logo, that's a, um, it's an NVIDIA card. It goes without being talked about in the, in the session. So again, this is the sort of thing that the article doesn't talk about it, but we show you a picture kind of exposing something there, right? So, so there'll clearly be the ability to use some GPUs. Yes? Is that one gigabyte accurate? I think it's one terabyte. I think you're right. Yeah, a gigabyte of memory? That's probably a little low. Kind of like the other night at dinner where the, the lady ordering the steak said to the gentleman, I only have a six gram steak for you. <laughs> All the rest of them were about 100 to 150 grams. She, she, missing a zero or three in this case probably, right? Yeah. I think it's a terabyte of memory. I think you're right. So this is a glimpse of things to come. IBM doesn't typically do this. Now recognize this isn't our hardware. This is being designed in the channels by people that we've been helping with. But IBM typically doesn't show servers and things that are common. We keep those secrets very close. So again, an indication of opening up, being more transparent, working with other folks, doing things in an innovative fashion. And now the real reason, no, the real reason, the major reason I'm here today as well, beyond loving Brno and enjoying the hospitality of my colleagues that are here 
ecosystem has been very important to us. I mentioned and told the story about our experiences with the GoLang developer out of Oregon State. Today there are three places in the world that people as developers, open source developers, can get a cloud image to go do something on power. In fact, if you've worked on Fedora, anybody ever used one of our Oregon State cloud images? When Brent Bowdy was helping us from the IBM side on Fedora, if he ran across a project that needed something, he'd get the response, well, you know, we don't, I don't have access to power. Yes, you do. Here, we'll get you a sign on here at Oregon State. Here's your image. You can work on your project here and test that fix right here. Became a very important part of getting Fedora back up and running for power systems. So today there's three places in the world we can send people. Oregon State, our second relationship is with the State University of Campinas in Brazil. It's north of uh, Sao Paulo, out, in the, out near Hortlandia. Unicamp is, is what we call that place. Our IBM China Research Lab, because universities are a little bit different relationships in China, is working uh, and has provided an open cloud for people in, the, in, in AP. So that's not quite a university, but that's the third and most new place. And today we're announcing that Brno's going to become our fourth on this world map, meeting a desperate need in Europe. We had a great discussion yesterday, a great set of meetings, a tour of this wonderful facility. It's a great collaboration. This isn't just about power and the Brno University. This is about Red Hat, IBM, and the university. And so that's going to be exciting. That's going to leverage the presence here of the, of the developers and the community. And we're going to go forward with both making these resources available and being engaged on research opportunities here in, uh, in Brno. So thank you very much for hosting us yesterday and making this possible. Okay? Oh, you're welcome. All right. Final few things. Where do you get more information? The Open Power Foundation website's a great place to get started. The URL's a live link in the PDF. And Roddick, despite the great email you sent out, I appear to be the only person who's told people, go make sure you submit your feedback on the sessions. I've, I've not heard that suggested anywhere. So I follow directions, folks. Go submit your feedback. Get out your phones right now, your tablets, your laptops. Go open up the thing. I've even helped you fill it out. <laughs> So if, if, if you can't think of what to say, it's right there for you. No. The group said, please give feedback, so I did that. Hopefully, through these three sections and the announcement, you now have some flavor and feel for how this is a different IBM relationship. This is a different environment. It really is open. We've anchored it in the Open Power Foundation. It begins with hardware, but it supports a whole software stack, firmware included now, that's open source. And it's not just about how Jeff and his team can be innovative. It's about everybody around us in the foundation in hardware and software. And so hopefully you'll feel, after this quick presentation, that we're more open than we've ever been. Any questions? We've got a few minutes left here. Any questions for me that haven't been asked? I do appreciate the ones that were asked during the session. Any questions? Yes, sir. Are there plans for a desktop platform? Well, first of all, my mother was an English teacher. She taught me never to say never and never say always. The wonderful thing about the foundation is that we're not dictating what people do. If somebody believes there's a market for that, then they'll create that. Do I know of any at this point? None to my knowledge. You know, IBM got out of the desktop platform. And the last one was the 720, the Open Power 720. For those of you that remember names and stuff from about five to seven years ago, 
That was the last one that anybody built. And so I don't know, but I wouldn't say never. Okay, great question. Other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, you're going to ask the software guy a hardware question. It's additional logic that runs over the PCI bus as I understand it. I don't actually have the detail. Now, it is, it's, it's, it's logic and, and communication that goes between the processor, but it does, like in an FPGA sort of environment, it does need some support back in the FPGA environment. So there is something that has to be implemented. The bus is still a PCI bus. And the application proper doesn't have to necessarily see CAPI, but you certainly change the way the application behaves. So it's not like you send a CAPI command, but it's how you set up the operation and how memory gets shared, which is a key part of accelerator design points. So it does affect the application, but it's not like it's a set of commands and buses. So or commands that go across the bus that the application sees. But yes, there's logic, and there are things that go across the bus. Because you will see if it's, um, in the Wisteron, in the slide for the stuff to come, there is some documentation that says, hey, there's five PCIe slots, four of them are CAPI enabled. And so there is logic that is both on the system side of that and will need to be on the adapter side. So you'll need a CAPI enabled adapter on top of that. Okay? Peter. Uh, so the question is, is the FPGA generally programmable? Yes, that's the point of the FPGA. Our vision is not that we're going to ship, you know, one FPGA that special purpose. There is some logic that goes into the adapters. I do not know if that logic is open source proper, but the rest of the configuration of the FPGA will be up to the people that provide the solutions. So I. Sorry, I don't know about the logic proper that we provide as part of the base, but the rest is certainly to the vendor who's providing the solution to go with it, okay? Great question, though. Yes, sir. Dan. How does Power9 fit into the Open Power Foundation? Well, let's talk about extensions to Power8 and GPUs. For those of you that haven't followed the press, uh, IBM won a contract along with NVIDIA and Mellanox to build the next supercomputer for the United States. Part of what we've said we're going to do there is take the NVLink protocol that is part of GPUs communicating today and embed that in the Power8 processor, meaning we'll have the first processor that will talk this high-speed link to the adapters, the GPUs, that have, that have come to industry. So that's sort of the next generation of what we see. Power9 fits in. We're collecting requirements now in the foundation. We're interacting with our partners. There will absolutely be input from all of the people there in the foundation. That's part of what the work groups are working on and grappling with. Uh, and so it will be our first real example of a major processor version with everybody around the table. So. I'm sure there'll be some dancing and some hugging and some crying and all the good things that go with foundation work, but uh, it's certainly envisioned and we're starting to have those discussions. Great question. She's given me the out of time. Josh, come on down. I'll be happy to answer your question and say good things to you. Not about you. I promised only once today. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Thank you for all your help. Let me know how I can help you. Okay.